the new year is often a time of reflection. A chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile, and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As a new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Amen. Hey, the old is gone, the new has come. Can we just give the Lord a praise for that? Great to be with you today. My name's John, if we haven't met before, and I'm thankful to be worshiping the Lord with you today and uh, just looking forward to what God has for us from His Word as we continue to worship this morning. We are talking about, as a church family in this season, as we are beginning a new year, uh, really this great reset where we're asking God to reset our most important relationships through the power and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And we began a couple weeks ago talking about resetting our devotion with the Lord. And we invited you, if you wanted to be a part of a 21-day journey of prayer and fasting where we are asking you to give up something you're passionate about, whether it's a food item or one meal a day or an activity, uh, and to give up that, that thing and so that when you're hungry, for that thing comes into your mind. It reminds you to pray for the many ministries of encounter as we're beginning this new year together. And I can't tell you how many different things I've heard that people are fasting from. By the way, we are two weeks in and we have seven days to go uh, for that. But I've heard people do chocolate, uh, as some people are fasting from. I've heard a couple TV shows that people aren't watching. They're using that time to spend time with the Lord. Uh, someone I met, talked to this week, was doing one meal a day. And then on some days, they were doing two meals a day. And so different things for different people. But to date, no one has told me they're fasting from the playoffs, all right, today for, for the NFL. So, but I do know some of you are praying and fasting for the results of the game today. Now, I, I'm a Niner fan, and no one told me there were so many, you know, cowboy fans in this area. I just was, I didn't know this, but I, I just learned today they practice in Oxnard. So this is, this is pretty cool. So kind of some good rivalry going on out there. Uh, but you know, what we've been doing in our, in our 21 days of prayer and fasting is that we're asking you to pray for the ministries, and we've been sending out these little highlight videos. And so today, we thought we would share with you our prayer focus for today. Uh, it's our student ministries at Encounter. So why don't you listen to Chris, one of our youth leaders, to just share a little bit as he shares about some things we can pray for for our youth ministry. Hey, Encounter family. My name is Chris. I'm a youth worker here at Encounter. I'm excited that we have the opportunity to pray for our youth today. Our youth group has grown drastically over the past year and it holds a lot of different teenagers that call Encounter home. Here are a few ways that you can partner with our team in praying for the youth. First, we want to pray that they can all encounter Jesus in an intimate and special way this year. We also want to pray for the teenagers who are struggling to find their purpose. We know that post-COVID culture is hard and we want to pray that they can seek joy and comfort in these times. Last, that we can behold up strong followers of Christ who look more and more like Jesus every day. And it's in these prayers that we get to trust in God to move within our youth. Thanks, fam. Appreciate y'all. Love you. Hey, can we give a hand for Encounter Youth? Yeah. It's been exciting to hear about so many new students becoming a part of our student ministries and returning students and just a great ministry that's going on uh, through our, all of our leaders and student leaders and uh, God's doing good things. Now, so we started with talking about resetting our devotion and then last week we talked about resetting the marriages that are represented in Encounter and we, I invited you, if you are married, to look at those four courageous 
courageous commands that God gives us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And I gave strict instructions to the married couples that you're only supposed to, when you talk to your spouse about them, you only get to ask for one command for them to work on. But I have learned from talking to a number of you that you're all rule breakers, all right? Because you couldn't hold back to just one. You had to like cover more than one. And so if your spouse brought up more than one, they're a cheater, okay? Just, I'm just telling you, they're a rule breaker. And so you got to follow the rules. You got to pace yourself. So, but those are good things. But isn't it a great thing that we don't have to stay stuck in chair number two uh, in those marriage relationships and we can be chair number one kind of people? And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can go back and listen to the message. Uh, it was probably the mes- best message I ever gave in my life. No, I'm just kidding. When, whenever I meet people in the store and they say, oh, John, I couldn't make it on Sunday, I'll say, oh, that's too bad. It was the best message I ever gave. So I just tell that to anybody who missed. But you can always go online and listen. But today we're going to talk about resetting another relationship. And it is a relationship that is the answer for the crisis of isolation that pervades our culture. It is a relationship that is the key tool that God uses to shape us as we are growing in our faith. It is a relationship that is the pathway that God uses to reach so many people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is a relationship that was painfully highlighted with its importance uh, during these last three years during the COVID season. And the relationship that I'm talking about are friendships. Friendships are important, amen? In fact, friendships feed our soul. You see, God uses our friendships to feed his hope into our souls. And I'm praying today that as we look to God's word and some great scriptures that speak to the topic of friendship, God has all kinds of things that speak to this topic of friendship, that we will invite God to reset our view of how he wants to use us as a friend in other people's lives. And there is a crisis of isolation that's going on around us. I believe it's a result just of some of the parts of our culture that are just ingrained into who we are. Uh, Some of it is related to social media. Some of it is related to just the busyness of life we are in. You know, we are more connected than ever before through social media, and yet people feel lonelier more than ever before uh, in history. You hear that all the time. And feeling isolated is not a new phenomenon. Feeling alone is not a new phenomenon. I think of my own life and different times where I felt really alone, going all the way back Uh, When I was a student at Biola University in La Mirada, down in the heart of L.A. and near near Anaheim, and I had this youth pastor that I met at a local church, and he was mentoring me in youth ministry, and during the summers, he was a student in seminary, he would go back to Hawaii, where he was from, and I became the intern, led the youth ministry while he was gone. And I'll never forget my first summer in being an intern at this church. I didn't know a lot of the people in the church. All my friends from Biola had gone home for the summer. And I found myself in La Mirada, a leader, uh, you know, of the youth ministry, feeling very alone, uh, feeling very isolated, realizing that the level of friendship that I had for that summer was at an unhealthy level for what I really needed to thrive uh, during my time there. And for one way or another, God led me into this conversation with this older man in the church at that time, and I will never forget the counsel that he gave me in finding friends. And it's counsel that God has brought back to my life at different seasons of my adult life and has used in powerful ways. And I'm going to share it with you a little bit later on in the message. But first, let's define some qualities of a great friend. Because the Bible tells us some great qualities of friends. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word this morning as I read our first passage. And we're going to pray because we need the help of our best friend, Jesus, when we talk about friendships. Amen, Encounter family? By the way, we're pretty full in here. Praise God for that. If you need a seat, the front row is wide open up here. (laughs) I'm not sure. Are you really my friends? Nobody's sitting in the front row over here. You know, if you're a guest with us today, we just want you to know how glad we are that you're here. It means the world to us. 
And we pray that you have found your home today and that God's whispering that to your heart even as we speak. Uh, if, you, if you are newer with us, we always put the notes. There's a, some QR codes you can scan as you come in. They're on the wall there and there and right as you come in the building. And it brings up the digital notes so you can keep those and have those. We also put them on the screen as well. And there are Bibles in the seat backs if you'd like to use those. Because God wants us to experience what Proverbs 27, 9 declares. We'll begin with this verse today. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. The heartfelt counsel, so not just any counsel, but the heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you right now thanking you that you are our friend. And a little bit standing in awe, Lord, that you get to be our Savior, our Messiah, and our friend. And we thank you for that. And yet, God, we also just recognize that you've designed us to also need friends around us in this life and in this world along with you. It's this crazy thing. And, and so we just ask that you'll teach us about friendship today. And we ask, Lord, that we would walk out of here just a little bit better friends than we were when we walked in because of who you are. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the first quality of a great friend is they strengthen our lives, they know everything about us, and they love us anyway. A quality of a good friend is that they actually bring strength to our life, they know just about everything about us, and they love us anyway. Proverbs 27, 17 says this about great friends. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And the idea that the Bible is talking about is how when you take two pieces of metal, two pieces of iron, and if you rub them together long enough, if you create enough friction and enough pressure with intentionality, then those two pieces of iron become sharper. And it's a picture of what God says happens with good friends. Where in the pressure of life, as our lives are rubbed together, God wants to sharpen us as people. And a friend who will take you to the truth and the hope of God's word, even when you don't agree and even sometimes when you don't want to hear it, is a friend that you want to hold on to, that you want to invest in, and that you want to ask God to shape you into becoming. A friend who believes with you and for you the truth of Psalm chapter 19, verse 7, where God says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. By the way, we have this amazing tool to help build friendships at Encounter that's coming up in just a couple weeks. We call it Group Launch. It's when all of our small group Bible studies start for the next uh, two months or so. And it's a really great opportunity because when you sign up for one of those small groups, you're not like signing with blood for the rest of your life, you know. Uh, but it's this group of friends that get centered around Jesus and the Word of God so that you can live life together and grow uh, in your relationship with God together in life. And so that's coming up just two Sundays from now. And part of the reason we do that is because friendships, they don't just appear. You, you can't just wish you had them. They, they don't just show up. You actually have to plan for friendship. You even can pray for good friends. And we actually have to actually invest in people around us in order to build good and great friendships in, in, in all of our relationships. And Proverbs 28 says this about healing from our brokenness and our mistakes before the Lord. And it's in the context of friendships. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. And that verse is speaking about confession in the context of a community of friends and how Christ died for our sins. And when we bring our brokenness to him in community, we find mercy, not judgment from the Lord. Can I hear an amen? 
You see, when we bring our sins, our failures to the Lord, we find his love and not condemnation. We find his presence when we would expect him to abandon us. And one of the ways that we are good friends to people around us is when we express those same qualities, the, the, a Christ-likeness to others around us by showing his mercy and showing his love and being present with others even in sometimes in times of failure. And having friends who really know you and still love you and even actually like you are powerful instruments that God uses to bring his hope into our lives. I was talking to a friend not long ago, and he's a friend that at times likes to remind me what I was like in college. Do you have any of those friends? We were roommates for a year. We actually go back to middle school years together, but we roomed one year together, my sophomore year at Biola University. And, you know, one of the things that always comes up when I talk with him at some point or another is how we always got into all these water fights, and I've shared this with you before, how we just always were having water fights in college. In fact, college was like, I know I studied somewhere in there, but it was like four years of water fights, whether it was launching water balloons at unsuspecting other college student friends or dumping buckets of water off the third floor of the dorm down to someone below or, you know, putting a garbage can full of water over the stall in the bathroom and, and so all kinds of things. But I basically had all kinds of enemies when it came to water fights. And this one friend, when, when I got married to my lovely bride, Amy, who's in the room today, uh, we had had the wedding. It was beautiful, the reception. And Amy had changed into like, you know, into our getaway outfits for the honeymoon. She had this cute dress on and I was dressed up nice and we came out from this reception hall and on the roof above us we didn't know it was this friend and another friend with buckets of water and as we came out from underneath the awning they drenched us with buckets of water now, I'm talking like we were soaked and this was in Bakersfield and by the way we were the only people who lived in Hawaii at the time and chose to get married in Bakersfield <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out, honey. But, but anyway, so it was 105 degrees out. And so we got into our getaway car and it was off. It was super hot. My friends hadn't left it running for me. And I turned on the car and then turned on the AC and they had put confetti in the vents. And so when the AC turned on, it blew all this colorful confetti, and here we are, we're all wet, and so the confetti stuck to our arms and our clothes, and because we were all wet, then the color from the confetti started to, you know, just run all over us. I look over at Amy, and she's just like a rainbow over there, just, just all this color all over, her hair is wet, and you know, this is not a good start to a honeymoon, all right? I looked over at her, and all I could muster up was, I deserve it. That's what came out. But that same friend who drenched me with water on my wedding day is a great friend. He knows pretty much everything about me, and he loves me anyway. And I can't tell you how many times at different moments in life We've gotten reconnected and God has used him, whether it was just to encourage me with a time of fun or a time of getting together and talking about life or talking on the phone or actually just praying for one another and the things that were going on around us. Do you have a friend who strengthens you, knows everything about you, and loves you anyway? Are you a friend who strengthens the people around you. And even as you get to know them better and all their faults and foibles, that you love them anyway. Are you the kind of friend, that kind of friend in seeking to grow as one? And building on that quality of a great friend, the next one is that they also speak truth to us and we actually listen. There is a level of friendship with someone that when they actually speak the truth to you and you listen, you know they are a powerful friend in your life. Verse 14 in uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Christ, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. When the Bible talks about the very nature of Jesus Christ, we are told, that his nature is full of grace 
and full of truth. And part of being a follower of Christ and part of being a friend to people is to have this balance in your life where you are full of grace in your friendships and you are also full of truth in your friendships, the truth of the Lord. And it really is this, this, this powerful balance. And so having a great friend is, is more than simply having a great time together, although that's part of friendship, isn't it? And isn't it fun to have some people to enjoy life with? Some of you might hang out with a friend today to watch football. That's a huge part of friendship. But it's also having someone in your life who will say it like it is sometimes. And you actually trust them enough to hear them, what they have to say. And developing friendships over time who are willing to tell you the truth with grace. And you actually are able to hear what they have to say and listen. It's a life-changing quality in friendship. I shared last Sunday about this man. His, I didn't think I said his name last week. His name is Gerald. And when I was a youth pastor in Hawaii, newly married, and he was just someone that I met through youth ministry. And he approached me one day at church. He's like, hey, you know, he was, I was newer, and he, he came and got, got to know me. And he says, I, I love to cook. And I would love to cook for the students in the youth ministry. I'm like, yeah, where do I sign you up, you know? And so whenever we had a big event, and we're talking like big events, or we had a camp, Gerald would show up and he would cook for us. And he basically had a cooking habit that he fed through feeding teenagers. I I mean, he did. Every time I would be around Gerald, he'd show up, he'd have a bigger pot than he had last time. Because he was always dreaming about how he could feed more teenagers and feed more people in the name of Christ. And I just got to know him at all of our camps and our events. And over time, I just started watching his life. And I realized, man, this guy's really got a good marriage. And, And he's a really godly man. And he's got good friendships around him. And he's a good dad. And at the time, I shared last week how he was that person in that key moment in my life that reminded me that love and marriage is, is, is a commitment. It's a choice. It's not just this happy feeling you have. And it's not based on all of your expectations coming true in your marriage relationship. It's a choice that God empowers you in as you sacrificially love your spouse. And I will tell you, I have a better marriage today because God placed a Gerald in my life at a key moment. He was a good friend And sometimes serving side by side in ministry is one of the best ways to build a good and great friend. It's it's just one of the beautiful byproducts of serving Jesus together. Another quality of a great friend is they are for us and with us even when we mess up. And what I'm not saying is that they're for the thing that we're doing wrong, but they still believe in us. And they believe in how Christ can heal us, even sometimes when we are not in the moment. They're for us and they're with us even when we mess up, which is what Christ does for us every day. Do you know that? See, if you're a child of God, you know Jesus Christ as Savior. Because of his free gift of grace, he never leaves you. He's always there. He's there to walk with you in your brokenness as he leads you to his wholeness. And everyone messes up. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That wasn't loud enough. That was so... Everyone messes up. (laughs) Yeah. Proverbs 27.10 states, Never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. When disaster strikes, he won't have to ask your brother for assistance. It's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. And Proverbs is saying, A true friend, a great friend, is someone who's there to help you when disaster strikes. And the Bible actually doesn't define the disaster, but basically scripture is saying that a friend is someone that is there to help you without you even having to ask for their help when disaster comes. And the disaster might be a physical disaster or it might be an emotional disaster, but they show God's love in those moments and they say, hey, I'm going to do what's best for you, even when it's hard for me, no matter what I get in return. That's a friend. I'm going to do the best for you, no matter whether it's hard for me, no matter what I get in return. And as Jesus said on the eve of his crucifixion, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And he modeled that all the way to the cross and out of the grave. 
even as he invites us into the greatest relationship, the greatest friendship possible, and that is knowing him. It's why Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Ah, we all know how true that is. When you fall or life falls around you and you feel alone, we know how much trouble we feel in because God uses friends to help feed his hope into our souls. To help us when we have physical, when we need physical expressions of God's love, when we fall down, when we mess up, or when life is messed up. And great friends are for us and with us even when life is messed up, even when we mess up. And this is the beautiful thing about friendship, is that God brings all kinds of friends into our lives at different times and on different levels. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but, you know, there are all different kinds of friends. You know, there are certain friends that are situational friends, like you know them through work, you know them for being on a sports team, they're your neighbor. Uh, you are friends because you're in the same context in this moment of life together, and they're good friends. Then there are other friends that we, God gives us in life that are seasonal friends. Like, you know, God puts them in your life for a season. And then maybe they move or work, your work group changes or something. And you're no longer in that same group, but they were there for a season and God used them for a season. And then there are also lifelong friends. And when you have a lifelong friend, I mean, you know, they're like a sibling to you. Because you fight with them like a sibling, Right? That's how you know a lifelong friend is you, 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 you'll go to bat, you know, you'll, you know, really, you know, go to arms against each other, but then you'll also go to bat for each other. You know, we have twin daughters, and I learned this early on as a dad of twins, like, you know, if you're, like, in an argument or a strong discussion with one, you're really talking to both of them. I mean, because they're twins. I mean, they're not just blood, they're twins. They shared the womb together. And man, you, you're talking to one, you're talking to both. And it's the same with a good friend, a lifelong friend. You know, I shared about that friend earlier who dumped water on me. He's part of this group of five friends that I have that go all the way back to middle school. There's a, six of us. And in that group of six, a few of the men who are in that group now came to Christ during our middle school and high school years. And it is so powerful, to, and I know it's unusual, to be friends with them all of these years later and to see how God has used the fruit of Jesus Christ in the life of their families and as, as they walk with the Lord. And we haven't done it every year, but just about every year. COVID messed us up a little bit a few years ago. But we will get together and we come in from four different states. We, we live all over the United States and we'll come together. We'll get together usually in Lake Tahoe for a few days and we'll just hang out together, laugh about jokes that we've joked about a hundred times together. But without fail, you know, we'll ride, I don't know, these crazy things, ride inner tubes down frozen rivers, you know, things like that. But, you know, without fail, at the end of our time, we just sit down before we leave and go our separate ways, and we just talk about life and what is happening. And even times where we've messed up, these have been lifelong friends uh, for each other, and it's a powerful thing. And if encounter, if I might pause a moment, it's okay to have different levels of friends. And even though people are different levels of friendship in our life, every one of them is a powerful instrument that God is using. And one of the things that we all do sometimes, I'll own it too, is we actually vilify people that maybe God placed in our life for a situation or for a season, but they didn't become a lifelong friend. And I actually find that most of the time when we vilify someone because of that, it actually has more to do with us than it does with them, because it all counts. And sometimes God gives you somebody for a season, and that's just the instrument that he's using them in your life right now. And sometimes God gives you an even shorter friendship with someone in a situation, and they are a blessing, and you are a blessing to them. Maybe God is just using you to shine a light to them because God uses friends to help feed his hope into our souls. 
And, 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 and so instead of viewing them as you know, vilifying them, we want to see them as God's gifts no matter how long they're in our life, no matter whether they become a lifelong friend or not. Are you looking for ways to be a great friend to someone in your life right now? Because there are endless opportunities and God may use you for a situation, God may use you for a season, or he might be developing a lifelong friend, but they're all blessings from the Lord. And Christ is the model of being for us and with us even when we mess up as he's leading us to wholeness. And it leads us to another quality of a great friend is that they encourage our relationship with Christ. You can have a lot of friends, but a great friend will lead your life toward the Lord. They will speak and live with the hope of the gospel in a way that influences you. They will be growing, even though they're not perfect, as a godly brother or sister, and it influences you. They lead you to God's grace, and they lead you to God's truth. Their influence draws you closer to the Lord. That is an element of a great friend. Proverbs 27, 9 says this. We read it earlier. The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. I, I really love that verse. It's saying that there, there is a special counsel that only a good friend can give you. It's heartfelt counsel, meaning that when they are speaking to you that counsel, it it says it's a sweet aroma, meaning that it actually, there's something in your heart when they're talking to you and they're interacting with you, it just brings life to your soul, and it brings life to your walk with the Lord. It is heartfelt counsel, and one of the things I just want you to know, I think I've, I've yeah, a little over four months that God's had us here uh, in this role of lead pastor, and I'm so thankful. But I can't tell you how much in that relatively short amount of time God has used the, the men who are part of our elder board as heartfelt counsel around my life. I don't know if you know this or not, but the, the current group of elders that we have uh, in our church family, they basically were servants who were used by God as servant leaders during some of the hardest years of this church family. They, they were during, all during the COVID time, and we all know how fun that was for everybody. They were used by God to be a part of two lead pastor searches. The amount of time and investment and prayer that goes into that process, being on this side of the process, I can't even tell you how much energy and sacrifice was given by these amazing servants and their wives because being an elder is a team sport. It's a team sacrifice. By the way, uh, one of the things we're going to be asking for you next Sunday is just to reaffirm one of our elders. Uh, The way eldership works at Encounter is uh, people have a three-year term, then they are reaffirmed for a potential another three-year term, and uh, next Sunday we'll be asking for your affirmation of Patrick McCaslin. Uh, He's been an elder for the last three years. And also want you to know that Don Chambers, and his wife's name is Laura, Don is wrapping up this month the end of six years of being an elder for the last six years. And I think we should give a hand to Don and Laura. So, uh, Being an elder is a team sport, and I'm thankful for their leadership. And I can't tell you how much uh, sweet counsel It has been to my life in the short amount of time of being here for the life of our church and for my life. And I also want you to know as we vote on affirming Patrick next Sunday uh, that he and his wife Julie, they're involved in so many different ministries of our church family, but in their heart of hearts, they're disciple makers. And it's one of the best qualities you can find in an elder is to be a disciple making family. So I praise the Lord for them and uh, we'll look forward with your affirmation of serving again with Patrick. David Hansen wrote this in a book that he wrote titled The Art of Pastoring, and it's a book written for pastors, but there's one chapter in there that's worth the entire book, and it's about how Jesus reflects the heart of a friend, and you might remember how Jesus was called a what of sinners. What was he called? Yeah, a friend of sinners, 
we think of that as very positive, but it was actually, he was called by, that, by his enemies. It wasn't a compliment when it was said of Jesus. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 34, the Bible says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, and they're speaking to Jesus, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And all over the New Testament, we have examples of Jesus being a friend of sinners. He visited with them on the streets. He called them as disciples. He attended their parties. He went over to their house for dinner. In and through friendship, Jesus shared the hope of salvation through a relationship with him. And Jesus even made house calls. Do you know that? He did. He made all kinds of house calls. And friends make house calls. He sought out Levi, who we also know as Matthew, and there was Levi at his tax booth working, and Jesus said, follow me, and Levi followed Jesus. And then Jesus followed Levi, because Levi invited Jesus to, to one of his parties, and it was a party, you know, one of those parties? And Jesus went, and Levi's friends became Jesus' friends. And then Jesus is walking along the road, and he sees Zacchaeus in a tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, can I come over to your house for dinner? And I don't know if you've noticed this about our Lord, but he's always inviting himself over for dinner. <laughs> he is. In fact, it's godly to invite yourself over for dinner. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> it's a way to make friends. Just invite yourself over for dinner. In fact, when Jesus invited himself over for dinner at Zacchaeus' house, he had such a profound impact on his life it led to repentance. And we read in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, <laughs> Oh, the day we get to say this is a special day. Today, salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. Jesus sought and saved the lost through friendship. He entered homes to heal and to teach. He helped some men who were almost skunked fishing and helped them catch fish. He made wine at the wedding of a friend. He received a costly act of love from a woman at the house of a Pharisee. And Jesus' friendship carried him all the way to the cross. In fact, we can say that the cross is the culminating act of Jesus being a friend of sinners. Your friend and my friend. And as we read before on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus told his friends, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And when Jesus befriended sinners, they followed him. And when the disciples befriended sinners, they followed Jesus. And it's an example for us encounter as we live on mission together as a church family, as a community of friends, as we encounter God together, encourage each other, and engage the world for Jesus Christ. One of the qualities that led me to marry my wife Amy when I met her, was she had these great friendships. And I saw her interacting with people who were far from knowing the Lord. I just saw her shine with the love of Jesus and speak his love into their life. And I saw how God would use her to help draw people, whether they knew the Lord or hadn't, didn't know the Lord yet, towards the hope of Jesus Christ. And I would tell you, one of the greatest qualities I love about my wife is that I love Jesus more because she is in my life. And having a friend who strengthens your walk with the Lord is a powerful quality in the way that God uses us. Great friends strengthen our relationship to Christ because God uses friends to help feed his hope into our souls. I shared earlier about when I was an intern a youth leader at this church in L.A. during my time at Biola. It was my first summer doing it. I did it for a few summers. And there I found myself in La Mirada, California. In the summer, all of my Biola friends went back home and no one was in the area. I didn't know anybody. And I really didn't know very many people at the church either. I knew the students, but I didn't really know a whole lot of other people. 
And I turned the corner in life, and all of a sudden I realized I was lonely. I felt alone. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Never been a youth leader before, leading a youth ministry before. And I, w- I was hurting inside, and somehow I ran into this older man in church. It was one of those divine moments, one of those divine conversations in life. And I just shared a little bit of how I was feeling. I didn't trust him enough to say everything, right? I said, I'm, I'm kind of feeling lonely. I don't have any friends this summer. He basically looked at me and said, John, there are always friends there for you. You just have to look for them and ask God for them. And it's not true that you're as alone as you feel. And he said, I want to challenge you to do something. I want to challenge you to go home and to pray and to ask God to give you three names. Three names of people that you can invest in this summer to become friends with. And so I went home that night and I prayed and I said, God, give me three names of people, at least I know their names, so I can kind of become friends with them this summer. And God gave me three names. And that summer, I began to invest in those friendships along with everything else I was doing that summer. And I would tell you by the end of that summer, a few of those three became really good friends. And at different points in my life, I'll turn a corner Something will change, a seasonal friend will move on, and I'll realize that my friendships are not as healthy as I need them to be. There's a hunger in me and a need in me to have more friends than I do, and I will always come back to that principle, and I will pray, and I will say, God, give me three names, and I'll begin to reinvest in some lives, and God has always brought some good friends as a result. And one of the things I've found as I've gotten farther along in life is that about every three years, sometimes even faster, everything shifts. Have you noticed this? Someone moves, jobs change, you know, just life is happening, and all of a sudden your friendships get re, you know, distributed, and you almost have to recast your friendship net. And one of the things that I have discovered is that I have to sometimes chase people until they catch me. I do. I chase them until they catch me. And I will tell you, I have some of the best mentors in my life because I chased them. They were busy people doing great things, and I chased them until they caught me. And sometimes with friendship, it's the same. You have to chase people until they catch you. And so maybe, maybe, maybe today God is just saying, hey, there's somebody Got to chase them a little bit. Ask them out to coffee, begin to walk once a week, play a sport together, get in a small group Bible study, serve in a ministry. The possibilities are endless because God uses friends to help feed his hope into our souls. And it is hard in this world to find great friends. You can't just wish them into existence. And you can't expect them to make the first move. You actually have to plan for it and pray for it and invest in lives and ask God to shape you in the process into the friend that he wants you to be in people's lives around you. Would you step out in faith and ask God to use you as a friend and give you better friendships in the process? It is part of his gospel plan. He brings his hope to this world through friendships. And who knows? Maybe God's got a situational friend or a seasonal friend. And maybe in time, they'll become a lifelong one. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to just start out by saying thank you for being a friend to this sinner. I'm so thankful for your friendship and your leadership in my life. And we just thank you for being our Savior and our friend, and that you are always with us, always for us, even when we fail, and that your grace is there and your truth is there to lead us to wholeness. 
And Lord, I just lift up anybody in the room who's needing some friends right now. Probably all of us on some level or another. Lord, if there's someone who just is struggling and struggling to connect, give them a couple names and give them the courage to invest and lead the way. And Lord, I also just ask that along the way, you'll surprise them. Just surprise them with what you do. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen.